the song, was the standard rule. In the middle. Hello, good afternoon everybody and welcome to Wicked Wales International Youth Film Festival 2022. We're delighted to be here in Rill in the Town Hall in this really beautiful building and we are very honoured to have our panel with us today and our representatives from our youth creative group Bank, who are here to chair the session. The session is all about um, progressing with a budget from your first or second short film and how you move forward with your career as a filmmaker. And we've got some very, um, we've got filmmakers with us today who have made that leap from making their first short films and, and moving on. So we're very interested to hear their thoughts on how to work with a budget. So thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the session. Hi, so I'm Rebs, this is Phoebe, um, and we are co-chairing the panel today. So this panel is about progressing as a filmmaker, about development and funding, and making that leap from beginner to further on in your career. Um, so I'd like to introduce our first guest, who is Matt Evans. Um, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, thank you. So I'm Matt uh, Evans, um, I'm a filmmaker from Anglesey. And I've been doing films now since about 2019. So I started with script writing in my undergraduate and wanted to make that transition into filmmaking. I wanted to actually make the writing work. I had no idea. So I took up a master's in filmmaking. I made a couple of short films in the course. And then um, tried to now, since I make films, you know, once I work in a full time job. So I've tried to continue that. I work a little bit with some production companies. Um, so it's small roles sort of, sort of assistant editing or running or sort of sit, um, assistant producing a little bit. But yeah, mostly sort of in the independent sort of filmmaking and sort of side of things really. I think we've got a short clip to show as well. The centre's history goes back over 50 years. And it was just solely weightlifting. There was just bars, weights and squat racks. And it was dusty and horrible and it smelled funny, but I mean, it, it, it created so many champions. Okay, so, so when I came out of the army, Hollyhead Weightlifting Club was a community club. So it had a constitution, but it had 70 pence in the bank. <laughs> this is where it gets fun now. You were familiar the whole time you was trying to get this Oh gosh, yeah. You, you didn't build something uh, like this with, without a lot of grit and determination, with a lot of politics as well. And if they'd have been 20 years younger, I would have taken them outside a council office and beaten them to an inch of their lives. That's how ignorant they were as people. We seem to thrive on the fact that people feel comfortable when they come in here, they're comfortable with the instructors, they're comfortable with the other users. The staff here want people to understand what they're doing. Everybody has this thing in their head that HRWC is just a weightlifting gym, which isn't the case. I, I knew when I went to the Olympics I wasn't going to win a medal, but I knew that the I, I, I knew I could, I could win a Commonwealth Games. There's so many uh, good news stories that have come from the gym from individuals. It just makes me think back to what we all started off with. The companionship, the leadership, the environment, it's all a package. I'm Mara Dries. Um, I have made uh, one film 
um, before and I'm in kind of production or post-production for a second film, um, which I was lucky to get some funding for. Um, yeah, both pieces are Welsh language pieces. Yeah? And we've got a little play to show you. Um, hi, my name is Osha Roberts. Um, I'm a 2D animator, and um, yeah, for some now I've worked on two films, uh, Trowerin, which came out last year, and then Ranoch Baich, this is a film about um, mental health and farming, which I finished um, about three months ago now, and um, yeah, uh, that's about it. <laughs> I think we've got a short clip. Last but not least, we have our final guest, which is Dan Thorburn. Would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Dan. I'm a writer and director from Manchester. I have had two short films funded in the past three years by the British Film Institute, um, along with early future development funding. And so I'm quite used to working with those guys and have also worked on funded projects as a director with Arts Council England. We have one last Show you Dan's work. All right. Uh, who's that? Uh, I was the insurance fella. What do you say? Huh? Said it's worthless. Same old bollocks about sea rising, coastal abrasion, erosion. This isn't going to be land for much longer, apparently. That's it then. We're leaving. This is all we need to tell us to go. Go where, son? Tell me, go where? I... Anywhere other than here. Isn't that obvious? Gotta be patient. People will show up. That nah, people haven't shown up. Enough! This place is crumbling around us and you still don't get that, do you? No, what did I tell you? You're, You're an old man stuck up. in the past! Oh. Funding you've received, not just for the projects we've seen, but 
any project you're currently working on and your experience moving from a beginner filmmaker into working with a budget on your film. So I'm going to go through the same order we just did. So Matt, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, with funding, I've not had, so most, basically every um, application I've put in is, has been rejected. So I've never had sort of um, funding with any sort of established body, but I, when I went to do my masters, when I wanted to move into filmmaking from writing, I was quite lucky in the sense of Bangor University at the time, their course, they had, for the final project or the dissertation, they had a thousand pound budget to give to students. So it wasn't a traditional application for me, that was a guaranteed thousand pounds. Unfortunately, I don't think, I think since COVID, they don't do that anymore. But I'm, so I have no idea maybe the relevant universities about or the colleges that maybe have something similar to that. You know, so, I'm sure everyone's panel know, like, you know, and applying for funding can be a bit of a lottery, you know, you have to put in the strongest pitch. I've somewhat got to that stage yet myself. Um, I was mentioned last week I've had no rejection on, you know, these things, so I'm still working, working towards that. But so that thousand pounds I knew had the bank, and then I, I filmed the so, um, between the headphones, it was a short film I did, um, had student band, the Oman, and then we had Hannah Jarman and Tidy Rowan as well. So, so it was trying to see how far thousand pounds could go, but also I was quite lucky. I was, you know, still living at home with my parents, and um, I was getting because um, I was working as well, so I had further money as well. So because that time was when I was spending, I wasn't using anything to go to travel to university. I put that money into the project instead, so I was still using it. And what I saved, I put student loan to that as well. So that film then it was like um, it was trying to see how far I can make that money go. So contacted agents to their own hand jamming and I thought I'll take advantage of the time because with COVID I thought it would be without work for several months so I thought there's a stronger chance that even as a student I might be able to try and get professional actors on board so luckily they both you know they both straight away worked for it so that was fantastic you know and to their, to their own even offered to do the project for free so but I, you know I think it's one of the most really important things is to make sure you pay people so I did you know I did pay them as well but as well, the, the thing is with that, that course is, so I had a thousand pound budget guaranteed, and I also had, I knew I'd have a crew as well as students. So um, it was sort of taking advantage of that. I couldn't pay the students, but I knew I could pay them back, you know, I couldn't pay them financially, but I could pay them back on my time. So they had their own projects that helped out with them in the following weeks or months before that. So it's not the same traditional way of funding, but it was a, you know, it's looking, I think, a little bit at what other options there are out there, you know, so there might be somewhere where you can have a, a smaller, it might be, you know, as a less competition or somewhere where it's a guaranteed sort of flow of money coming in. So the project I've shown there, that's had no funding from anybody, so that's just something I've done myself in between jobs. So I'm at the stage now where I'm submitting that to film festivals, I just submitted it, started submitting it last weekend. So because I've had no funding, I'm waiting for my next pay packet to pay for the more submissions, as people say on the other panel, you know, you pay between your jobs, aren't you, pretty much. So, that one, my brother's done the animations, my older brother does animation, and that was, inc you know, incredibly lucky to have that resource available to me, so we managed to come to agreement, you know, how much I pay for the project, sort of thing, obviously it's a reduced rate, you know, sort of thing, but it's, you know, that I can help him back in the future then, with what he wants to do, so. I think, you know, it's, as someone mentioned in the panel, it's about making those connections with people as well, so it's like the students I made, con uh, made connections with that I work on projects and I want to try and work on projects in the future as well. And so you just try, try and build that little s support network around you, I think, a little bit. Um, but that documentary, I think it's, yeah, it's not costing me that much to make, but it's taking quite a bit of time, so. I think you just got to be a bit resilient when making films a little bit, if you do it independently like that. It's, um, I don't know the best way to put it, but it's, I started filming that project back in November. I tried to take this, I tried to pitch this project twice to some people, it's always come back and rejected it again. So I got fed up, I invested into my own equipment when I could, so I built up my own equipment along the way. I wanted to become my own little studio, I didn't want to rely on other people, I didn't want to wait for someone to say yes to me. So. I managed to save up, managed to get a uh, you know, camera, um, you know, managed to get the you know, editing computer, managed to get sound kits. You know, so I was able to go in 
and try and make a professional look in film. Like, well, it's, you know, I've got a drone, I've got a drone license into this. But it's taking a while to get to that stage. So I started out making films on my mobile. So I did a documentary. I went up to Scotland. There's a lad who's walking the whole coastline of Great Britain to raise awareness for his condition, HMPP, which is hereditary neuropathy with pressure palsy. So he feels um, he feels pressure a lot worse than people. So he could be writing and be lost in the last few minutes. That right. So I was too scared to take the university's camera off there. I was only about three, four months into the course, so I had no idea how to use them. So I had to say I'll take my mobile. So. When I took a to Scotland, filmed that with him, sat it down. I had like a little mini gimbal, um, cost about £20. Rode microphone, cost about £30, £40. So my film equipment was very, very cheap. The only thing it cost me was the hotel the and stay when I went up there in the petrol. That was the only cost. So the film was made for about £400 in that sense, really. Um, and then, like I said, it was just trying to make a transition into professional equipment. So. I was learning with people around me who've done film courses or who are professional filmmakers that seen what cameras they were using. So I'm not wasting money, um, you know, on just getting anything. I ended up trying to find a like hybrid camera between photo and film so I could do a little bit of work photography wise if that came up as well, so to fund the projects. Um, so yeah, that film has taken me from November and I've only really finished it last month, I would say. So it's been, you know, I know people with documentaries, it takes a lot longer to make. I think it said something that the average documentary takes up to about five years now for any kind of filmmaker because of funding, because of work between jobs and all sorts. Um, but yeah, so it was a little bit of not wanting to wait <laughs> for yes from somebody. I got to the point where I was like, I'll just go make it myself. So yeah, it's taking a lot of effort, but I'm pleased with the result. And it feels like it's an elevation from the previous work a little bit to the quality I feel, but it's still, I think I know where I am on my journey as a filmmaker, I feel I know I need to go to the level to, get to, to be able to apply my funding. A lot of my work is, the feedback I've had from funders, from the rejections, is if anyone's seen my last film, Twin Headphones, it's got a strong production design, it's a bit like a Wes Anderson style film. This documentary is nothing like that, and previous, my previous um, short is nothing like that either, so I'm still learning my own film language, I feel. Um, so funders are saying to, you know, I'm seeing it with other people's work, I've seen Ocean's work and Dan's work, that there's a consistent, um, you know, style, consistent uh, tone that a funder can say, yeah, that is exactly, I know what we're going to get from, you know. So that's where I am, I've been working towards and I find my voice in it a little bit more and keeping it consistent, I think. But yeah, so I was a bit longer there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, but I think that, you know, that clip we saw is a testament to your resilience and filmmaking to kind of persevere and obviously get that work looking great because it does look really great. Um, and it's, you know, like you said, there are alternative ways to find funding, like you said, with your course. There is, you know, not just applying to funders, but there are ways you can find money to make your film. So I think it's a really interesting thing to make. Um, Marek, how about um, you with funding your film to Sisqiad? Um, so, Kasesh the ad um, that you saw the clip of was um, not funded, um, so we just made that kind of independently, um, which was, yeah, a lot of work, but a really wonderful experience and kind of gave me the confidence to then pitch um, for a project called um, Bangladesh Cymru Climate Stories. Um, so, I was really lucky to get the funding for that. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm kind of in post-production for now, a film uh, as part of that project. And what was the process like applying for that? Um, it was uh, really kind of straightforward, to be honest. Um, you just did a kind of paper application, so wrote about your um, what you wanted to create and kind of why, uh, and then they selected people to be on a week-long workshop of kind of script development and a lot of the other projects are documentaries um, so I was really my piece is kind of a, a fiction but in a documentary style so I wasn't 100% that we sort of really fitted into that but I was very lucky that they kind of saw the story um, rather than the style uh, so yeah after the week of workshops we did a kind of pitching session online um, I think there was a panel of maybe 
20 or so people kind of listening to the pitch, and then I guess they work together to select, or I'm not entirely sure who selected, but yeah, um, projects were selected from there. Do you feel that if you hadn't made that first film, that you wouldn't have been able to have managed to obtain that funding? Because a lot of people just say, go out and make films, and it can be a bit daunting to get the ball rolling, but do you think that really helped inform your ap application to already have something? A hundred percent, and I think for me as well, kind of feeling like I could do it, because um, I think sometimes, you know, it can feel a bit daunting applying for funding where, I mean, it's imagined pressure, isn't it? But I think maybe we can all relate to feeling that pressure of, oh, someone's kind of expecting me to do this now. Um, and I definitely, yeah, was kind of feeling that pressure. Um, and I think if I hadn't kind of made, because actually I hadn't just known, oh, I, I can do it, I can produce something, you know, that, that gave me sort of a bit of a push to, to sort of feel, well, why not? Why not apply and, and see? So, yeah. Um, Oshan, um, do you want to talk a bit about the funding you've received or funding applications in your experience? Um, so, I, I feel like a bit of a fraud. I haven't had any funding for <laughs> my films as of yet, and I haven't actually applied to any funding yet. But, um, yeah, so I've worked on two films up until now. So my first film, Truerin, I made um, in my last year of university. And, um, yeah, so no funding for that film. And then the second film, Jean um which was, again, no funding for that film. But it's, uh, I, I think, like Matt spoke about earlier, it's, um, I think it's about connections that you make and stuff like that. Because in, so I was in Manchester studying when I made Truerin. And um, it, it was kind of at a point where I was like, I was about at a bit of a crossroads with animation. I was like, um, my family and like my friends and stuff will know that like, I, I always felt like I, I didn't feel like animation was for me maybe. And I, I felt like maybe I'd go more down like an art path or something like that. But then it was just, I, I found it was about finding something you're passionate about and working on that. So um, yeah, so Truerin, I started working on the idea for it in the final year. And then I made some brilliant connections in that year. I, um, that's where I collaborated with Isla Jasmine Blake for the first time, who made the music for both of my films. So again, that's a connection that I've made, and it's managed to stay relevant for both of my films. And although I haven't been able to pay her for her work, I, I'd like to think it's, it's a collaboration that's like been beneficial for both of us. And, um, yeah, so with the second film, Ranuch Abayich, as well, it was um, a film that I worked on during my master's in Cardiff. And again, no funding, but I was able to use those connections that I'd made in the past. I, like, I, I was able to ask Ayla to work on the film again, which she, she thankfully did. And um, also with, with the people that spoke in the film, with it like taking a bit of a documentary angle, I, I made the connections, like I reached out to them through people that I knew from previous work and that sort of stuff. And I, I think like when you don't have funding or like limited funding, I think it's, it's about like working, working smart and like um, it's about those connections and like things that you've built and um, yeah, just making the most of that. Yeah. Yeah. So my next film will be my third film, and um, I I really want to push for funding on my next film because I I feel like it kind of limits me to like so with the second film now I just can't like I I'm for my first film Drawing I made the film free way and I was able to get it into like a few festivals I got it like into Cardiff um, international. Um, Cardiff Animation Festival, and like um, it got shown in Brittany as well, and in Serbia thanks to uh, Wicked Wales and Filmy Bank. But like, it's um, having no funding limits you, I think, because I can't I can't afford to submit the film into festivals. It's which is a shame because it feels like I'm holding it back. So I always try and like with Rana Khabaich, it's up on YouTube, and like I try and do it that way. 
which it's a bit of a shame because I feel like a lot of the time it can get lost to um, people involved in film and maybe the people that want to fund. But with the next film, I'm really pushing for funding. That's like the goal. And um, I, I've got a few ideas, like I'm, I'm in the early stages of working on, but maybe with the film camera beacon scheme or that sort of thing, maybe I could get some funding. Dan, we'd love to hear from you now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure thing. So with the work that I've made over the last um, probably three years, um, my first two, well, my first funded short was a film called Truckers Atlas. That was funded back in 2019 by the British Film Institute through the Film Hub North and the BFI Network program. So they've been working on through network for the last five years, and that's currently in a slight reassessment stage, but they will have funding that is going to reopen uh, early next year in, or springtime, I believe. Um, so the BFI offer up to £15,000 of funding per film. Uh, so that's what we received for Truckers Atlas, which was my first shot with them. Um, the main part of the application process is down to the script you've got, the, um, the way in which you kind of feel about the work and how you kind of put that forward to them. They're wanting to make interesting, socially conscious work that says new things, and they fund per film hub around seven films a year. So the application process is quite difficult and there's a lot of competition, but it's certainly the best way that I've found to, uh, to access funding um, in the UK so far because since uh, iShorts and stuff like that have disappeared, we've really kind of struggled for that funding. Um, I have been told that when they do reopen funding next year, it's going to be for a wee bit more money, because with 15, you really do kind of struggle to pay crew and make everything kind of even up. Uh, so my kind of journey from leaving university was to kind of come out of that with a really solid grad film, which is what I use as a platform to apply for, uh, for further funding. And utilizing that film, which is a, just a small two-hander called New Wild Heaven, uh, along with a script that I wrote with a co-writer, Jack Sherrett, and um, a producer, Sarah Palmer, we put forward our application to the BFI and were granted the money to make Truckers Atlas. Um, when I first received that funding, that was when Alice Ramsey was the talent exec there. She's now at BBC Writers Room. And her initial kind of talk with me said, what we're going to do here is three shorts, then you feature a film. That was the, pro the kind of process they wanted to take me on over the next kind of five years. Um, after Truckers Atlas was made and the BFI had kind of adjusted budgets and stuff, the kind of the new thoughts really were two shorts and then a feature. So that was after Truckers, which was a really smart first funded short, but again, it was a two-hander. It was nice and simple, one location really, uh, something which you can, the, the execs there can believe that you can make to a high standard and it will kind of perform well after that. Um, the big step after that was working with then Amy O'Hara, who took over from Alice as the talent exec of Film Hub North, and she said, you know, the next film that we're gonna fund with you has to be that calling card short, which is something that proves that you're able to then make that leap to feature. Um, so again, that was about kind of drafting up a script, uh, developing with them something that, you know, that fits your voice and suits your tone and something which proves that this is going to be that calling card piece. Um, so we were successful in the application for that and Saltwater Town was made. And then off the back of that, I've since received early feature development funding uh, where we've been working with the talent execs there at the BFI to develop my debut feature. So that's kind of the process that I've been on over the last three years or so um, with, those, with those funders. Do you feel like you have a lot of independence through your filmmaking once the funder's involved? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something that you're always a wee bit worried about when kind of applying for funding and bringing on other people to develop it. But all my experience with the BFI is that if they like the script and they like who you are as a filmmaker, you know, they might have small amounts of notes in that when you first start working with them, um, but really they tend to kind of leave you alone. They're there to support production. Um, they're there to support budgeting, and if you really did get in any trouble, they'd be there to help you out, but they kind of do tend to leave you to your own devices and then come in again in the post and just kind of make sure that everything's all hunky-dory before it's then sent off and delivered, and that's when you then kind of move into your, your festival run. I think something that a lot of emerging filmmakers struggle with is the actual like producing aspect and finding that that just the money and how to deal with the budget and that kind of thing. And um, 
creating your first kind of like pitch deck can be really, really daunting and that kind of thing. When you were working with your producer, is that someone that you met at film school or is that someone that you found through networking? Because there always seems to be 10 directors for one producer. So how did you meet yours? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I'm asked all the time and I do talks like this. And there's something that people really struggle with is finding producers. Because like you say, they are really difficult to get hold of. And if they are interested in production and good at production, within two, three years, they're going to be moving on to TV and feature stuff. They don't hang around in that short space for very long. Um, I was lucky enough to work with a producer called Sarah Palmer who met at university and she was, again, same stage as me where she was quite young and just starting out. Often what the BFI, uh, especially and from my experience, would prefer is for first time directors maybe work with a producer who's a little bit more established and does have a couple of shorts under their belt, not necessarily funded but work to a kind of high, high caliber to prove that they can kind of take on 15, 20 grand budgets. Um, I think what I always tell people, and it was really interesting, uh, myself and the talent execs have been chatting to people who are in this kind of stage over the last few few weeks, is that when people are looking to find producers, um, the most important thing to remember is that you're looking for somebody who's going to be a creative collaborator and somebody that can come on board. Like The relationship between a director and producer is like a marriage, especially when you're at kind of feature level where I am now where I'm looking to develop I'm developing feature films, the connection I have with my producer needs to be really solid. There needs to be a lot of trust involved, and they need to be just as involved in that creative process as yourself, a writer, or if you are a writer-director. So when finding a producer and going out there to try and find somebody, you really need to be careful that you're not kind of looking for somebody to do a lot of hard work for very little or any money. You're looking for somebody to bring their creative influence on board. You're not looking for a line producer. You're not looking to say, here's a script. Uh, can you produce this and make it? You need to make sure that you're kind of finding somebody who has a similar voice as you. Producers have their own slate, their own voice, their own stories that they want to tell, and somebody that you can develop that piece with, whether that's in a development stage, treatment stage, script stage, mm. and that they're going to have part of their own voice in that work because that's what producers want. That's how this collaborative experience works. So one of the big things you find a lot of the time, especially when it comes to BFI application season, is tons of people go looking for a producer for a BFI short. Here's a script. Can you make this? Can you produce this? And the tough thing for producers there is the production, the, end, the, the application process is, is quite long. You've got to have budgets, schedules, a lot of work's got to go into that for no money because if you don't get that application through, there's no money for the film, let alone any money to pay back the producer for that time. So something that I've, I'd always tell everyone is really important is make sure that you're looking for a producer to creatively collaborate with, not somebody to do a load of grunt work for you and then you know, make your vision happen because that's a real surefire way to put off producers from wanting to work with you. I think that's really great advice. I think, well, this session was born out of the fact we talked to a lot of filmmakers and they feel that the skills to apply for funding, and I think you know, we've had some discussion about obviously being rejected a lot, the, the skill to have a great application is sometimes gatekept by people and not shared with young people wanting to apply for that funding. And I kind of want to throw it over to anyone, obviously, to answer, but where did you learn how to write your applications or have, what support have you been given in terms of that as a filmmaker or maybe haven't been given as a filmmaker and maybe if you haven't, what do you need as a filmmaker to kind of move forward with that? I'm happy for anyone to answer if anyone... Uh, yeah? Applications, anything that I've had to um, working on, talent, talent schemes and successful applications to that is... People just really want to feel your voice as a filmmaker. If you're a writer, a director, a producer, whoever you are, you've got a voice, you've got stories to tell that are inside you and you're desperate to get them out. And yes, you need the money to do that. And yes, you are kind of standing there saying, you know, I, I need this cash, otherwise this isn't going to happen. But, you know, so many people will get bogged down in an application process about making everything sound perfect and neat and tidy and writing it like a, a dissertation and, put, you know, a real complex piece of work. But really, write in the style of your voice, write in the camera that you speak, write in your dialect, write in, you know, if you, if you want to write like you talk, get it down there. And the same at your script level, really, people want to read something that feels like it's coming from a person that exists, because a lot of the time these are online applications, it's very rare um, that you're going to be able to pitch yourself in person, so you need to get your personality across on those words, and you might only have a thousand words, you might only have a 500 word director statement to go along with a script, so make sure that that's that tone and your voice of who you are is in the script, but also make sure it's in that 
you know, that, that directorial statement, make sure that when they read that, they know who they're speaking to. They know they're speaking to a person who, who cares about the story, who cares about making film, and who cares about you know, themselves, their community, whatever it is that the story's speaking to. And I think that that's sometimes people will really worry, and they'll think that, oh, this needs to sound really professional. They don't care. They don't want to, they don't want to work with a professional. They want to work with a filmmaker. They want to work with someone who, who's got a lot of heart and a lot of drive. I'm intrigued, Dan, Oshan, you have obviously you spoke about not applying for funding. Do you feel like as a filmmaker you've been given support in even just starting that process or knowing where to start? Um, yeah, like I've, I've, even though I've not applied yet or received funding, I've like I've started making the connection of like applying. I've, I've spoken to Film Cymru a bit about like their, their application process and um, what they're kind of looking for because. I've always been told with my work because it's Welsh language and it's animation, which like makes it a bit unique. It, um, that it's like it's highly fundable, like a lot of people tell me. So I was speaking to Film Cymru, and uh, they've given me some pointers about what they look for in the application process. Um, so, th like like you said, they just want your identity. They want a clear idea. They want something you're passionate about, and um, also again. A producer, you need to work with a team. You can't just pitch on your own. And um, again, going back to the idea, of, like a producer not not doing all like all the dirty work. Like it, they 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 recommended that the producer should be part of the project. And then um, when I spoke to um, I, I spoke to a producer at um, Cardiff Animation Festival, and she's previously worked um, on a Beacons funded project. And she was able to give me some pointers and stuff, and um, said like she'd be happy to help if I wanted to go forward with an application process. But yeah, I I'd, I'd say the most important thing is just being passionate about what you're doing and it, your work being unique. Because again, the likelihood of like a one-to-one -one interview in person is going to be quite thin. So you need like you need to work to translate. So whether that is through the script or through the story month phase. It's important that you do that, so. Yeah, as I say that, I remember when I was very naive and I just finished my undergraduate, I thought I'd just try and apply for, I think it was weekends at the time. I had no idea how to write applications, I had no idea what, what they were looking for. Obviously, that one got quickly rejected, but my, um, my lecture um, that I that I had for my script writing in Cardiff, uh, Dan Anson used to write for Trace Speaker, he does a lot of radio writing and children's uh, novels and I guess. He put me in contact with um, a producer who, you know, ha had um, his, his works very similar to what my, uh, my first script did, so I did theatre script for my undergraduate dissertation. And this one I really want to make, but I have no idea how to go about it, you know. It'd be a very low budget film, but still it's just knowing how to get this in front of people, how to write the applications, how to, you know, what to look for. And but having that and having the producer on board, you know, he's been helping, so he's been one who's been uh, helping me alongside the application, he's been telling me what to do, you know, fill it out and bits uh, put together, you know, parts like I said, um, you know, that I'm not mentioning about your voice and getting you some bits and things I never considered that I need to go into it. So having him there on board has made a massive difference to give me a bit more confidence. I know we still haven't got any funding on other projects yet, but it's still, I feel like it's a progress. I feel like I'm starting to get an understanding because when I did my master's filmmaking course, so it was nearly, it was like, you know, 85, 90% practical, the course, but I felt one of the biggest modules, the biggest part of it that helped was the, the like modules understanding the industry. And it just gave me a, you know, I feel like it opened my eyes to what exactly, you know, the, the differences between production companies, distribution companies, you know, the roles, roles in production, you know, producers, executive producers, these type of things. You know, things that I hadn't really been taught before, things that I've learned before. So I think making, obviously making films is mass important, but also understanding the industry is, if not more important, I feel in some way, if you want to progress, you know, as a filmmaker, if you want to step out from you know, no slow budgets into, you know, budgets and things. I think you need to know, you know, who you're talking to, you know. I think it's, um, like, because I've followed a lot of filmmakers and their work, so one of the best ones I see is, like, Jim Cummings in, um, you know, the one in America now, he's on Thunder Road, and to get to see how he does things. 
and it's like he says, you know, anyone you're talking to, if you're going to try and find a producer or, you know, talk, looking for funders, make sure you know who they are as well. Don't, you know, don't first think of them as another application, you know, another person at the end of, a, at the end of an email or phone call. You know, look at their work, get to know them as real people, see what they like, you know, and, you know, it makes a big difference when you tell people how much you appreciate their work as well. And to get, you know, so you start to make that connection, start to see them, as, you know, just, so it's not just seeing it as at the end of an email, and things get as massive important. So, yeah. Marion, any, any tips or pointers in terms of applying for funding? Obviously, you've re recently received funding yourself. Um, is there any tips you would give personally? Yeah, I mean, I've had maybe a bit of a different experience because I produce both things, which um, I didn't know if I would be able to do that for this funded project just because it was a lot more work. Um, you know, it was organizing a full shoot and stuff, but I don't know. I think, going back to what everybody said, really, if you're kind of, if you really feel the piece and you really sort of, feel the kind of drive to make it, I think you sort of can just do things, maybe more than you thought you were capable of. Um, and I guess that's the same with kind of applying just, yeah, sort of, I thought of it almost like a, a real privilege to be able to share that idea with someone and that someone was going to read that idea and, you know, be receptive to it, even if they don't pick it it's still kind of, it's a beautiful thing to be able to share that. Um, and then it kind of, it makes you look at it in a different way. I think you focus more on what it is that you want to share, you know, which is ultimately the film, isn't it? Rather than how to fill out a kind of good application. So in terms of the actual funding process, I know things like Folio from Film Cymru a few years ago, they broke down the application process into they ideally wanted a script, a shot list, a preliminary budget. They wanted people attached to this. And it was quite a lot of expertise needed for something that was meant to fund someone's first film. So I haven't applied for an awful lot of huge amounts of funding, but I was quite surprised to find that they wanted a shot list when... I just had the script, I didn't even have a cast member attached. So in terms of like things that people have funded for you, what have you provided to them through, like in terms of like documentation through the process? Just throwing that out to the floor. Yeah, okay, I'll answer, sure. <laughs> um, so I know full well that with the BFI, the most important thing is the script. That's what it really comes down to. You know, it's un, un, something that's under 15 pages, ideally, something that's really tight, really well written. They, they're written through, I know, so in their last block of funding, they had about 100 applications, and they fund about 6%. So it's, it is really quite difficult to get yourself into the position where they're going to run with one of your shorts. Um, the script's the most important thing. and. The other thing to remember is, although they call it kind of first film funding, like they, you need to have other film work to prove that you can do this. That especially with the BFI, you need to have, you know, my grad film, at the time, probably, I probably wasn't aware, but after speaking to Roxy and some of the execs, it was massively integral in getting that first fund uh, for Truckers Atlas. You know, they're chucking 15 grand on the table uh, and not expecting anything back, and on the back of a grad film which cost about 400 quid. So, like, it's really important to make sure that you can show that there is uh, work that you, you know, that you've got the talent to make work before they'll put that money out there for you. So, and that can be filmed on your phone, that can be filmed in, in the bedroom. They don't really mind how that looks, but it really kind of comes down to showing that you understand performance, you understand cinematic language, you understand how film works, and, uh, and basically how you can uh, improve as a, as a director. That's something that's really important to them because you know, when they can only fund five, six films every year, they want to make sure that they're actually going to get a result at the end of that. So I'd say the most important things are the script, absolutely. Uh, and then previous body of work that proves that you can, you can work in cinema and you understand how cinema works. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in, I think, something that shows that you, you, you understand how your style of cinema works. So if you want to shoot everything in a certain way, you want to understand how that 
you know, give them some proof that you understand that that will work and that that can work. If you want it to be really shaky and handheld and you know, it doesn't have to look professional, but then embrace that and say, yeah, that is because X, Y, and Z, and that's how my style works. Um, alongside that, I know that you need a director statement, a writer statement, uh, a production budget breakdown. Um, you don't need to have HODs attached to application process, and you don't need to have cast attached to application process, but the BFI will need to sign off on HODs. So if you do have HODs that you know you want to work with, and you know that they have a high standard of work, and you can attach them that early, attach them, because it will only help. Um, and the same goes with cast. We didn't have cast attached uh, when we put application in, but before we heard back, we attached um, Neil Bell and Chris Hitchin to Trippers Atlas, which um, I, you never really know, but may have potentially helped. But when it comes to casting, um, you've got to remember that the BFI are there to help young filmmakers develop their career. That's, you know, that's what they want, that's what they aim to do. They aim to take you from the level where you're at now, where you've maybe dabbled in, cin uh, in making cinema and you're starting to understand who you are and want to be as a filmmaker, they want to take you to the top height. So although it's scary, they do need us as much as we need them. So remember that, that they're not these big, scary, faceless corporations. They're real people reading these applications who want to feel emotion. Um, and don't worry too much about the technical side of it. Like, I know that um, Boiling Point, when that was pitched to them in 2020 or 2019 as a short, with Stephen Graham attached, it was turned down from Film Hub North when Baratini uh, was set to direct because they didn't believe in the story enough. That, you know, there's, there's definitely, uh, it comes down to something that feels original, something that feels exciting, and something that's maybe saying something which hasn't been said so often. Um, I'm kind of just repeating some of the stuff that Roxy was speaking about when I was with her in Sunderland uh, on Thursday, but she was saying that you'll often find that certain themes and ideas will seep through kind of the nation's consciousness and sit in a lot of filmmakers' minds and they'll get a lot of applications about the same, dealing with the same sort of issues. And it's really worth kind of taking a step back and thinking, what do you want to say that's unique and original and maybe hasn't been said before in British cinema? And also, watching all of their shorts, you know, anything that Network put out, which is probably about 30 for shorts a year, try and get through them throughout the year and understand what other stuff they've been funding, or even just Film Hub North or, you know, whoever you guys are working with as your Welsh funders, I know that, like, VFI have their access here, watch all the stuff they make and think what, what they said and what have they not said and what could fit within that landscape of that work. Breaking down that kind of scary picture of these organisations yeah. is quite daunting. Like for you know, a starting filmmaker that you, you don't really know too much about these companies. They just seem very big and scary. So I think what you said there is really great. Um, I wonder if anyone watching has any questions they'd like to target a specific member of our panel or just in general any questions about funding. Um, I was just wondering, how do you find your members of the crew? You want me to answer you as we go? Is it friends? Find members of the crew? Yeah. yeah um, first films I did, that was... So when it came to like, narrative, uh, you know, fiction films, it was students then. People I made friends with in the course. Um, but between the headphones, it was made during COVID, it was made, like I said, September, October 2020, where I think it was when there was a fire break situation in between then, I think we were just about to go into another one, like, a week after we filmed, but, you know, I, got, I, I tried to get everyone involved, I had one of my friends, he's a joiner, I got him to help build the, um, the flats for us, things like that, so, made a bit of money, getting cheap for me, I got my nine's gardener to help transport equipment, you know, it was really just thinking, right, who's got this, or who's got the skill set here, and just asking, you know, People like being involved, people like to feel like they're being helpful, you know, so I think it's find anyone, you know, I think it's like I said, it's important you pay people, so I did pay both of them because I was lucky I had a bit of funding, I say, but many at that point, you know, but some people you can do them, they'll, they'll do it for a favour in that circumstance. Um, but then when it's come to my, when it's come to like my documentary side of things, they've been pretty much, like, um, my first documentary, I went up to Scotland, my dad came with me and he sorted out the B&B sort of while I went off walking this lad and he was like he was a taxi driver me because I was walking a couple of miles on the Scottish cliffs I had no idea where I was and luckily my phone battery was dying at the time but I had to quickly try and get in contact with him so 
that was a, you know, that, you know, that was a massive help having that support there. So you know, your family will want to help out as well if they can. Um, and then with the one the clip was shown, the uh, Ray of Hope documentary. You know, I, everything that I, I'm not the best with um, technical equipment. I'm, I'm not the best editor. I'm not the best camera person. I'm not the best sound recordist. But I know enough to be able to do the job. I feel. So I felt that's the biggest thing I've, uh, I think to myself is that I've developed the skill set to be able to make films on my own. I don't have to always rely on somebody. You know, it's very difficult to do with fictional narrative films. You know, you will need a crew with certain bits. But I feel like documentaries, particularly, you know, you can make them on your own, or you know, you can, with very little help. And there's, there's that saying as well: always make the film that you can make right now as well. So. I was in between jobs, finishing masters, in between jobs. I felt, you know, didn't have the money at the time because the work wasn't consistent. So a documentary felt like the next thing I could do. You know, the gym um, is you know five minutes away from where I am, so I can go back and forth quite easy with that. So it meant that you know I would get there about half an hour early and set up all the equipment on my own. I did have to buy a few little bits for like the stand to make sure that I had the um, you know the boom was held in place, you know, the sound record this, we had to make sure we got sandbags, got the sound, the, the stands. So, you, if you really want to, sometimes you'll just find a way, I think, you know. So, but then, like I said, with, with that film, the only bits I can't use, the skills I haven't got, is, you know, animation, illustration. I, I can't draw, I can't animate, I'm rubbish at computers and GIFs, and so, but look at my brother who's there, he, you know, he's done the green animation, he's been doing it for the last sort of 10, 12 years, so, I was just working with him on that one. And then my younger brother with some other recreational bits, you know, he's done a bit of acting, but he was just happy to go and look at the camera and things like that. So, you know, I was lucky to have my brothers both interested in this helping out as well. Like I said, I've had my family, my mum helped me with um, in between the headphones with the set design. Because I spent most of my budget on that. And I thought, like, because I'm still learning, I thought one way to really get people's attention is to make it look visually different. So I spent, I, I tried to make it like a bit of a Wes Anderson film, so I thought that might capture people attention and might capture like, an, an audience there. So, like I said, my mum helped me with that one because I have no idea when it comes to <laughs> interior design or anything like that. So, yeah, I think it's, it depends, like I said, this documentary, you can do, I think, I think you can do one on your own if you really want to, but when it comes to that, you do have to find a crew, but people want to help out. So I think just, you know, all you get to them, so you want to get involved, and they're quite happy to do a lot of time. crew on a short have got to be people who believe in the project always. You're not going to be able to pay back two rates, even with 15 grand. BFI, you have to pay everybody involved, but you're only going to be able to afford national minimum wage, minimum really. Like, you back two rates for your loaders and your focus pullers will be 400, 500 quid a day. It's never going to happen. So that's one of the reasons that they're upping the amount of money that they do uh, offer, because 15 grand is nowhere near enough anymore to make a short on. Um, but I'd say that it's just about finding people and crew who are happy to step up. Um, Seconds who are stepping up to first, Sparks who are stepping up to Gaff, people who believe in you as a, and believe in the project. And I think that's why, you know, the best film festivals you can get into are the film festivals you can go to and the ones where you can meet people, meet crew. Um, if you work in the industry yourself, uh, otherwise, get, when you're on set, you know, just making those connections, chatting to people, finding people that you can trust. And don't be afraid to, you know, ask people, like, ask people for help. Like, ask, you know, get in touch with, if you, if you really like the way a DOP works, go and speak to them and see if they're, they're interested in your short. You know, you'd be surprised how, you know, five days for them on not a lot of money, if they really believe in the project, they'll be happy to jump on board. And then it always helps to, you can then get below the line crew on board if you've got established HODs who are interested and they're gonna learn from that. Otherwise, it's people stepping up, people who have a little bit of experience, who've maybe been loading for years and want to step up to first, but so they have the skill set, but they don't do that professionally. It's finding people like that who are happy to jump on for 120 quid a day. I think it's always going to be hard crewing up um, a show. It's so much down to your producer to have a ton of contacts, down to you as a director to um, have a project that people believe in and believe in you and know that they've seen your past work and know that you make good quality stuff, that they're not attaching themselves to a project that's going to crumble or end up being something that's kind of substandard. So it's really just, some, I'd say, building a network of people that you can trust over the course of, over years and calling in favours and owing favours. I think that's, the industry's built on favours. So, you know, saying to people, you do this, then I owe you. And they will call you back and you will, you will work for them on something else, I think. That everyone understands that that's how this industry works, which is quite helpful. Okay.
I'm really sorry to interrupt in this, but you have a film screening in less than an hour. So the public will be coming in in about half an hour, and I'm sure you all want something to eat. <laughs> so if you want to eat, um, you need to wrap yourself in something. Apologies. I think what we'd like is just a quick briefing of what's next from everyone, just a brief snippet of what's next, and then, then we can round up. I think we could all sit here and chat for hours about this. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, it's so it's really because it's so important. Exactly. But if uh, you all, maybe in order of where you're sitting, just want to say briefly what's next for you. And, um... So, documentary just done there, I hope. Just finished it, so that's when we're going to submit to film festivals now. So, as soon as we get more paper tickets in, more will be going out. Um, but I do want this, like I said, I've. Um, with the producer I've got, I've been trying to develop the, the theatre script, no, the theatre script. We've been looking at maybe we need to go back to doing a short film first, as I was saying, but I'm trying to get that voice in the film, you know, because a lot of my work is, is very, like, very, like I said, I've gone between documentary, I've gone between narrative, fictional films, so it's like, it, um, trying to look for a short now where it's in a similar tone to the theatre script idea I've got, just to have, you know, give more confidence to producers and backers to say that, you know, I'm able to do this, and this is, you know, I can, I can direct this, or I can write this type of film. So, um, there's that one then. And then, yeah, I've been doing a few other, sort of, got another sort of documentary, sort of, series, I'd like to see on Anglesey, type of thing, like an online series, I think, to have, you know, like a rolling, sort of, series documentary, five, ten minute shorts. So, lots of ideas at the moment, just trying to get something, yeah, into motion. Um, yeah, so like I said earlier, the next film will be my third animation, and um, I, I've already like decided. I think I'm going to go back to um, to making work about like Welsh history and that sort of stuff, because uh, with the last film I took a bit of a gap away from that. So um, yeah, the the next film I've I've got a few ideas, but I'd say the one that I'm like feeling strongest about, and I haven't seen anything about it yet, is. Um, is uh, a lad in Patagonia in uh, Argentina, so I I think it would be like a really good idea to make an animated short about um, Patagonia and the uh, the Welsh settlements you have over there and stuff. And uh, I I think it's an idea that I maybe could pitch and get some funding on board with. But yeah, I think that's the idea. I have a feature in development with the BFI and with. Chris he's attached to produce, and I'm currently working on a TV series with a really cool up-and-coming writer, um, which we're, you know, we've got uh, Simon Maloney uh, is executing, who produced Time, so, so he's at Sister Pictures now, so we've got some really cool people attached to that project. Um, just finishing the uh, new project, um, that'll be in the next kind of couple of months, and then, yeah, see you from there. and what's coming up and I'm sure the film event will be sharing all of your stuff to make sure that we can uh, get the word out there of what you're doing next. So thank you again for coming. Just